Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Happy Friday, everybody. We cover all the news that you need in business, economics, and finance through our lens of our Bloomberg Intelligence folks. They cover 2,000 companies and 130 industries all around the world. And we also tap our expertise outside of Bloomberg Intelligence as well. And for that, we go to Lindsay Piesga. Uh, she is chief economist over at Stiefel to talk about the jobs report. OK, so we get the jobs number. Then a couple hours later, we get uh, Chris Waller coming out and talking about the current batch of data requires action. And if appropriate, he will advocate for front-loading cuts. What does if appropriate mean to front-load cuts for a 50 basis point cut in September? Well, I think that means that if we see a material uh, weakening in the employment data, if we see a material weakening in the inflation data, the Fed is poised to take a more aggressive stance. That being said, the lack of meaningful downward momentum that we've seen in price pressures coupled with still a somewhat benign employment report. Remember, we saw that downtick in the unemployment rate, stronger wage gains. So it doesn't seem that at this point, to Waller's, uh, to use Waller's characterization, it is appropriate uh, to, to result in a more aggressive policy res- response. And as, as such, I think the Fed is going to take a more tempered approach until we see a, a more clear indication of weakness as opposed to just normalization in the economy. All right, somebody comes up to you at a Starbucks this weekend and says, Lindsay, how's that labor market? How, how would you respond? Well, I think right now we're still seeing solid conditions in the labor market. Now, certainly we have lost momentum from earlier peak levels. Top line hiring has slowed, but let's put the unemployment rate in perspective. It's still on a relatively low basis. Wage gains are still solid. Jobless claims continue to tick down. So there's still indications, again, that the labor market, yes, is cooling, losing momentum, but more to the prospect of normalizing as opposed to indications of outright weakness, suggesting that the Fed needs to take expedited or or more aggressive action to help supplement or stabilize labor market conditions. Actually, that, that happened to Michael McKee. He was on a train and someone like random guy was like, hey, Mike, what do we get from the Fed? Um, so, Lindsay... Is this uh, is the Fed going to go 25 or 50? And I guess the better question is, how much do you care about that versus us still pricing in 240 basis points of cuts in the next, you know, 14, 15 months? Well, I think the Fed is going to take, again, a slow and tempered pace. I think out of the gate, 25 basis points is appropriate. And the Fed has been very clear they're not on a predetermined pathway. And should we see the data come in better than expected or weaker than expected, the next policy response will reflect that data. And so that's going to really be the driver of how the Fed responds over the next year or or two years in terms of slowly returning us more to a normal position in policy, as opposed to taking an aggressive approach and reversing us to neutral or well below. So, Lindsay, you Put this labor data together that I guess for me, one of the next questions is, how does that frame out how our U.S. consumer is doing? What's your view there? Well, I I think the U.S. consumer is um, struggling at this point. The U.S. consumer feels the weight of these higher prices, feels the weight of a slowing economy, but the consumer is still holding its own. It's still spending out in the marketplace and it's still the backbone of the U.S. economy. Oh, we love that. We love crying babies in the background. That's super cool. You can definitely bring them on air. We love that for you and for us. Um, So I I guess when we talk about how the data will evolve, what are we going to really be looking at? Is CPI really that important next week? Or is it just like, let's get past this 25 or 50 or whatever, and then we see how the labor market evolves? I think the CPI, the PPI are key data points that are really going to determine Uh, the trajectory of the Fed's pathway for rates. All right, Lindsay, thank you so much. We appreciate it. (laughs) Lindsay Biegs, a chief economist for Stiefel. Uh, She joined us on Zoom from Chicago. Uh, She can do it all. She can talk economics, and she can then go take care of the little ones. I mean, yeah. That's that's, That's why you guys are the best. I don't know how you do it. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg.
Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. All right, let's get more on this market reaction here. I'm at Miskin, co-chief investment strategist John Hancock Investment Management uh, joins us now. Hey, um, Matt, if I just take a look at what's happening within the market and the reaction. Oh, God, I hate to say it. Is this a Goldilocks move? <laughs> It looks a little bit like that, but the fact that the 10 year Treasury yield isn't backing down much actually to me suggests it's not as favorable. But it had a huge, um, you know, it, it had a huge run. It did. It did. And mortgage rates are coming down on that. And then you're going to get borrowing costs coming down on that. And we had oil prices lower. And all these things eventually are going to be good for the consumer. Um, but if economic growth is weakening, if you're not as confident about your job, you're not going to be as confident about spending. And right now there is a, you know, September weakness that's always seasonal. So we're, we're sitting here saying, is this seasonals or is this something more sinister? And for us, the economic data is weakening. We like defensive parts of the market. We like intermediate to longer term bonds. And we're going to sit here and wait for a better opportunity to, to look at risk assets. What's defensive in your mind, uh, Matt? Good one. Yeah, so good old utilities. Uh, <laughs> utilities are a part of the market that were left uh, for not, you know, like no one wanted to touch them for much of the last two years. They were only 2% of the market, um, the lowest level or sector weight in history. Um, they've been t on a tear here. And we actually like long lived assets. I mean, t you know, Alex, as you said, I mean, durate, like this week, treasury yields are meaningfully lower and longer duration equities should be rallying on that utilities are REITs are mm -hmm. even healthcare is getting a bit of a bid but then you've got things like financials which have done pretty well here that's an odd mix and tech which used to be the long duration asset is getting is getting hit it's um, true. so it's it's not making a ton of, it's not uh the dots are not um uh, connecting all at once here it's it's one week but the trend in terms of the macro data is what it is, and it looks like softening, and we mm -hmm. want to grab some good defensive parts of the market while they're still here for us. Yeah, and I don't want to make light of the fact that tech's down 1% and calling that Goldilocks, but just the idea that that sort of play versus, say, I mean, I'm looking at Dow Transport, it's only down, quote unquote, three-tenths of 1%. So I'm just wondering if it's more of a rotation within the market versus sort of a a broad based selling. Do you think that uh, when we get a Christopher Waller talking at 11, is that going to be an event risk for you right now? It could be. I mean, you know, right now, I think the Fed, if they push back too hard and say, look, we're not we're not going 50 basis points, we're not ready to cut. Um, I think if they do that at this juncture, you're going to be upsetting the bond market. And <laughs> there's few times in doing this. And since, you know, nowadays we've got the forward uh, guidance and we've got, you know, pricing in of how many cuts, you know, you rewind 10, 15 years ago, people didn't focus on that as much. But now that it's 100 percent probability of a cut in September, if not more, because you're saying, hey, it could be 50 basis points. If the Fed says, no, we're not cutting, that is going to be bad news for everything. Um, and so I think you need to hear the, the Fed speakers come out and say, yeah, we're going to cut. And if it, anything against that, I think is going to cause some volatility. Hey, Matt, on the fixed income side, how much credit risk are you guys comfortable taking these days? Not much at all, okay. frankly. Um, so we started the week at 300 basis points spread between junk bonds, high yield bonds and treasury bonds. And to put that in perspective, last times that's happened, 2021 before spreads widened, 2022, 2007 before 2008, 1999 before 2000. And 300 basis points is historically really tight spreads. And to us, that's just not a lot of value. We prefer if you're going to go even in investment grade corporate bonds, more of a single A type of average portfolio um, credit rating. And then we like agency MBS. We like all those bonds or all those mortgages that people locked in low mortgages. I don't think there's any prepayment risk. People probably aren't going to be moving again. True, um, true, true, true. And it's, it's good for their balance sheets. So, you know, they're yielding about 5% for 4 to 5% right now. So um, we're just looking at some high quality bonds, add that to the portfolio, lock in these yields while you got them. Because that cash balance that everybody's loved so much, that money market interest rate, in our view, that's gone into 2025. Not completely gone, 
but it's going to be I mean, hot. I'm, I'm waiting for it. We still hit another record high uh, at the end uh, of last week, according to the data that came out. Um, so do you think that it matters if it's 25 or 50 in September? And or is it really how many cuts we're going to be getting? I mean, we're still pricing in something like almost 10 cuts through the end of next year. Right. And, you know, I, I think about it as like, you know, getting lost in the forest. Wait, is it the forest and the trees, Alex? Can't see is the it? forest from the trees? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, something like that. So the, the past couple cycles, uh, on average, the Fed has cut from peak to trough 17 times. Now, that's oh. 25 basis point cuts. But 17 times is how much the Fed usually cuts in a cutting cycle. So whether or not they cut one time or two times at the first cut, don't get lost in that. Don't overdo it. What you want to do is set up for where this, where does the end of the Fed funds rate go? Where do we go on the 10-year yield? Our view, based on the last three cycles, the 10-year yield ends with a two handle, and the Fed funds rate ends with a one handle. If so, that wow. is the world yeah. we're in, we're having a different conversation right now. We want to get while these yields are where they are right now. Uh, I know it's been a quick move, but still, don't let it the volatility you know get you off course. Bonds are going to be likely recovering all that, in our view, majority, if not all, they lost in 2022. Uh, and we still got upside potential in the bond market. All right, Matt, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Matt Miskin, he's a co-chief investment strategist at John Hancock Investment Management, located up there in Boston. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Happy Friday, longest four-day week out there. I'm Alex Steele alongside Paul Sweeney. This is Bloomberg Intelligence Radio. We are broadcasting to you live from our interactive broker studio right here in cloudy midtown Manhattan. So the equity market really rolling over here. Uh, big tech in particular uh, getting hit. The NASDAQ is off over 2% below its 50 and 100-day moving average, making quick work of getting to that 200-day moving average as well. Not helping is what's happening in Broadcom. That stock down by over 10% on earnings that came out yesterday after the closing bell. Now, the money they made from AI and their forecast was really quite good. It was just everything else that seemed to disappoint investors sort of waiting for that trough, despite the CEO saying, yeah, okay, we might have found the bottom in all of that. Uh, but nonetheless, the stock is off quite a bit. Dana Woolman is Bloomberg senior technology editor. She joins us now. There's a lot to get through in tech, but I just wanted to hit on Broadcom. Um, when you're looking at the stock reaction to the news, like they delivered on AI. They made a boatload of money. They're going to keep making a boatload of money on AI. Do you think it's an overreaction from what you're hearing? A little bit, and my background is not in equities. But to your point, you would think that the worst news imaginable would be that the company was not keeping up with expectations yeah. on AI. In fact, it beat expectations in all the parts of its business that are related to AI somehow. It's really its legacy businesses that were flagging in the forecast. Um, but that, as you said, was enough to just send the stock down. It's interesting. It seems like Broadcom is well positioned for this AI you know, kind of phenomena here because investors, as you know, are just trying to figure out a way, how do I play AI? And really, do I just buy NVIDIA or are there other ways to play it here? So, but tell us about Broadcom and its exposure to AI and maybe how it's positioned. So I think Broadcom gets less attention in part because I think it's um, in a highly technical field, a field that's already just very technical and sometimes difficult to explain to yep. lay people. I think sometimes Broadcom's equipment is even more so, <laughs> um, but it's everywhere. I mean, it's legacy businesses. Um, it's, it's chips were already in everything from automotive to smartphones. Um, and its components are included in um, just AI setups mm -hmm. as well. Yep. And um, the it, it's not necessarily um, a one-for-one -one comp to what NVIDIA is producing, but just complementary um, mm -hmm. components and piece of hardware that people might not know the names ever think of, but are necessary in these larger AI setups. And also what I was reading is that if uh, a company winds up making their own AI chips in-house, they need Broadcom to do that. So there's that part of the business as well. Let's go to Intel because that stock is also off over 3%. Um, it's considering some options for its stake uh, in its struggling automated driving system provider, Mobileye Global. Can you remind us what Mobileye Global actually does? Mobileye makes automated an automated um, driving system. Um, so in so self-driving stuff? Yes, autonomous okay. vehicles, ah, okay. yes. And um, Intel has had a stake. It actually sold part of its stake last year. I believe we reported um, a profit of 
netted around 1.5 billion from that, but it's looking to sell more of its stake. Um, and as we report in the story, it's picking if it's going forward with this. It's picking a not great time. Uh, mobilized stock has been um, down a lot, and um, so Intel would not exactly be recouping on its um, investment if it chose this moment. But as we reported more broadly, Intel is in a dire moment. Um, it does seem to be considering some really desperate, um, severe measures to keep itself afloat. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I mean, it's in, Intel, it's down 62% year to date. 52-week low, down 3.6% today. You've covered this tech industry for a, a, a long time, Dana. What, what's going on with, Mo, with Intel? Did they just miss, I guess, the technological evolution of the chip business? Or is, there, is it management? What do you think is going on there? Certainly, management doesn't help. I mean, it had that big CEO shakeup a few years ago. That was when Brian Krasanich stepped down. It took yep. a while to replace him. And since Pat Gelsinger has been in the role, um, has bet big on the company's foundry business. And um, right. that is, um, in fact, dragging down the company's performance and seems to be, according to our reporting, um, something that the company's at least considering splitting off. Well, okay, but that's confusing, right? Because their whole pitch was that, yeah, yeah, we're Intel, yay, but now we're going to make chips too and be a foundry for us and for also you, so you can come to us and we'll make our chips. So why has this gone so south? Um, at least for now, the Foundry's biggest client seems to be Intel itself. <laughs> uh, um, gotcha. Yes. So um, for whatever reason, that part of the business has not taken off um, as expected. Um, to the extent the company has brighter hopes, it does seem to be on the chip design side, less the the manufacturing. So, I mean, but weren't they a beneficiary? Or are they not going to be a beneficiary of the U.S. government's investment in domestic chips? Um, huh. I think they'd like to be if they, they, like they, they be. had to delay that <laughs> right. plant, right? Yes. Um, so that that is something that our reporters are um, chasing is not just the fate of the company, but the um, possible ramifications for the government's um, investment plans in um, strategic areas that, of course, include um, the chip industry. Yep. And they're based in Santa Clara, California, um, where Everybody who is anybody in the chip business is based in that Santa Clara, San Jose uh, area there. University yeah. of Santa Clara is right there as well. Dana Woolman, thank you so much for joining us. Dana Woolman, Senior Technology Editor for Bloomberg News, uh, joining us live here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, which we appreciate on a Friday. I mean, people coming in on a Friday. He likes when people come in. Come in on yeah. a Friday. Special gold star. <laughs> but you're right, uh, the Intel stock is just getting crushed. And, you, you know, it's just a, a, it's almost like a shadow of its uh, former self here uh, with down 69%. Dana, thanks so much uh, for joining us there. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. So let's see, we're getting some moves here in the currencies a little bit. I'm looking at the Bloomberg dollar. Uh, index, uh, kind of a little, little, just a smidge higher on the Bloomberg dollar index. Uh, pound sterling a little bit weaker, the euro a, a little bit weaker uh, on the backs of some of this economic data we've got, including today's jobs number. Audrey Child Freeman joins us. She's a team leader and chief FX strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence. Uh, Audrey, what are the currency markets telling you about some of the economic data we're seeing, including the jobs data today? Well, the, the US dollar was already very much weaker getting on into the non-farm payrolls. And I think in the end, from a currency perspective, uh, for as long as we didn't get any major surprise one way or the other, uh, they, it wasn't going to be a, a game changer for the outlook for the dollar, which we know by now uh, has become a lot more negative uh, with the start of the easing cycle looming. Uh, and, and most likely now, uh, likely on, on September 18. So to that point, how much more downside then is there to dollar yen in particular? I think dollar yen is being driven lower by both, both by the U.S. side of the trade and the U.S. Uh, more dovish cyclical narrative, as well as the uh, Japanese side of the trade. And I think in that respect, there's probably room for, for more downside. Uh, you know, it's still very difficult to, to assess the extent to which, you know, the unwind of the carry trade is complete. So, you know, some seen some, some people saying it's almost complete. I, I think, you know, time will tell on that. Uh, 
uh, it's very complicated to to assess. Uh, but I think that you know the the growth, the rate differential uh, that's been driving driving dollar yen lower from one sixty to one forty two is going to continue uh, into Q four. We're most likely going to see a, a rate hike from the BOJ. Uh, and, and potentially even more next year. Uh, so I feel that, you know, the dollar yen peak is probably for me in the G10 currency space, the most obvious one to uh, expect to continue lower with the main question being how fast does it go lower? And for me, I've been in the camp that we're probably going to see a slide as opposed to another slump. So Audrey, what currency out there offers the best value from your perspective, do you think? Well, if if you're dollar bear, and I think for now we still are dollar bearish, even though you know I kind of feel that uh, the, the, this narrative that I've been describing about you know weakening U.S. economy, lower Fed rates, it's in the price, and I, I kind of feel at some point the risk would be that there's too much uh, dovishness priced in in the Fed because the U.S. economy, let's be clear, is not really falling apart. Uh, is just decelerating, inflation is coming down, and that means that we can normalize interest rate in the US, and that's fine. Um, but you know, in terms of which currency to play against, I, I said the yen is a good one. I also kind of like the Swiss franc, uh, just because I feel that you know, euro dollar upside at the moment is a very tricky one because there's one element in the Europe, euro, euro dollar bullish story that I'm still waiting to unfold, and that's a pickup in economic activity. We're not seeing that happening in Europe. When that happens, I think there'll be more momentum uh, mm -hmm. to the upside on the euro. And until that happens, I think dollar Swiss downside may be more appealing. And the other advantage of the Swiss franc, I think, at the moment is the fact that, you know, we've seen some episodes recently of more hesitant uh, market so risk appetites, uh, and the Swiss would do better if we were to see another phase of risk off market. So, mm -hmm. do dollar dollar Swiss downside is, is another very good and interesting pair, I think, uh, as we contemplate the outlook yeah. uh, in two four. In just about thirty seconds, what do we get from the ECB next week? We get another cut, uh, and I don't think that's going to be too damaging for the euro. But the euro badly needs an improvement in the economy. That's what we need for euro dollar upside to to go through 112 and 115. All right. Thank you so much, Audrey. Really appreciate Audrey Taylor Freeman joining us, team leader and chief FX strategist uh, at Bloomberg Intelligence. Need a better economy. Like, how do you get that? You just take a look at Germany and then the news, maybe that Volkswagen's going to um, close down some of its plants. Yep. Their industrial economy is just really suffering. How do you get the whole Eurozone to really start to outperform when Germany is really in the doldrums here? Yeah, and that kind of a lot of it, fit, it stems from they're just a big exporter, uh, particularly to China. Uh, and if the Chinese economy is slowing, it has been slower than expected, and that impacts big uh, export nations like Germany. And I saw that in that German re reporting about the auto factories, they mm -hmm. haven't closed auto factories since 1937. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, th that's not in their DNA to downsize. Yeah. Um, there was an interesting report out by Nomura that talked about how it's really tourism that is keeping uh, services up ah, and keeping the euro economy af uh, afloat. So we'll see what then happens when you get out of the summer. Well, John Tucker and I are the only people I know that haven't been to Europe like in the last year. So we're just... I haven't gone anywhere in a year. And more. I haven't been out of New Jersey in like 20 years. <laughs> That's not true. You come to the city. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Joni Biley. She is the Chief Workforce Analyst at EmployBridge. Uh, joining us from Omaha, Nebraska via Zoom. Uh, Joni, you and EmployBridge, you know exactly how employers are feeling here. What did you make of this jobs print here today? Well, this report definitely proves we have a weakening job market. Um, we've been saying that certainly for some time. We feel it in the temporary health industry. Um, our industry, the staffing and recruiting, you know, uh, of temporary workers has really been on a decline for about two years. And those are always the jobs that go first. I think we've talked about that in the past. Um, so it's pointing to, you know, more weakness. Um, obviously, this report did not meet the expectations. 
I kind of thought we might see this um, just because, you know, I'm constantly talking to employers of all sizes across the U.S., and there's a lot of uncertainty. There's economic uncertainty, and then there's also the election uncertainty. And so I think right now we're seeing a pause on hiring, um, and employers are, are just not adding to their payrolls mm-hmm. um, due to that uncertainty. So, Joni, that's such a great point. So they're not adding to payrolls. What do you think it's going to take for them to start laying off their payrolls? Well, we are seeing some layoffs here and there. Um, so that is, you know, concerning. What I think will maybe reverse the trend, I mean, it's going to be a number of things. Um, you know, I hate to say it, but we might have to get past this election, regardless of who wins, until employers can say, all right, I have to find my path forward and here's where I'm going to invest and hire. I think interest rate cuts will help certainly and you know maybe we'll see a little bit of relief if we do see um you know an interest rate cut which i i think we're all in agreement that we're probably going to see one the big question is how large of a cut will they do and there's going to be a lot of scrutiny uh certainly around that because that could signal you know are we maybe in a worse um economic picture um than people had realized but i do think an interest rate cut will definitely help Um, Because employers will then start to loosen up, you know, those purse strings and start investing again in their businesses. And that can certainly lead to more hiring. Joni, I like in your notes here something very interesting. Employers are focused on employee retention, but they are very cautious about hiring and adding to their current payrolls. How How long have employers kind of been in that mode? Yeah, no, that's a great question because that pendulum definitely swings um, from one side to the other. But I would say that we've seen over the last year um, employers very focused on retention strategies. Now, there's a few dynamics of what's happening. Um, Certainly in the supply chain world, you know, most of those workers are on site. Um, In the professional and business services, we've seen employers trying to bring people back to the office, but they're balancing that with also trying to give them flexibility. So they're very focused on what types of benefit programs they can give to them. Um, Of course, wages, you know, need to stay competitive. Um, Flexibility is certainly important, Um, but creating a great work environment where people want to stay, you know, where they enjoy the work that they're doing, that really has become a top priority. Um, And we're also seeing that that's what workers really want. You know, they want to enjoy the work, they want to enjoy the environment, and they do want to feel like their employers appreciate them and respect them. Um, and so we we definitely have seen a switch um, that employers are very focused on that retention strategy right now. Hmm. That feels like a young kid thing, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> Joni, when you take a look across sectors, what sectors are, are sort of stronger and what are weaker? And sort of how do you foresee that playing out over the next six months as we get past the Fed cut, as we get past an election? Yes. So certainly we've seen, you know, healthcare continues to be the strongest sector that is adding jobs. And I think we will continue to see that um, certainly, you know, as we look into 2025 and 2026, that sector will remain strong. There's a high demand. There's lots of, you know, opportunity um, in in many different roles um, in the healthcare sector. So that will be continue to be strong. Um, Construction, it was good to see that we added, you know, over 30,000 jobs in the construction. Um, Construction is a good sign that maybe we're starting to see some things um, pick up a bit. Um, But again, on the other side, we're losing jobs in manufacturing. The professional and business service sector only had 8,000 jobs created. Again, I mentioned temporary help actually lost jobs for the month, retail lost jobs. You know, so overall, this this really was a weak report. We're only seeing that job growth in healthcare and in government. 
Um, and then it's, you know, a little bit kind of trickled out through the other sectors. Um, but healthcare will remain strong. I'm really looking for manufacturing to come back, but we probably won't see that until next year. And, and another data point for the labor market earlier this week was the jolts report continuing to, to come yes. down. Um, how do you use the data that that jolts data? Is that important to you? It is important, um, you know, to watch the trends. Um, we really want to see that number start to reverse and climb. Um, unfortunately, it's it's lagging. It's a lagging report. But when you look at 7.7 million open jobs, to me, that's concerning because month after month, we're seeing that number soften. What we need to see is that number start to increase. And that is going to be the first sign that employers are going to be high hiring and adding to their payrolls, because the first thing they do is advertise those jobs. If they decide to hire, they're going to be posting those positions online. And that's what that report is truly measuring. So we want to see that employers are having more optimism about the job market, that they're going to invest and expand their payrolls and add. And um, I'll be looking closely to see, you know, what next month uh, reports for the JOLTS report. Hopefully it moves in the right direction, but right now it does seem, you know, to be kind of status quo. Before I let you go, what did you make of the wage number and what are you hearing? Yeah, so it's interesting on the wage number because the wage number is still showing that wages, you know, are strong and, and certainly competitive. Um, but that really has to do with the mix of jobs when it comes to that wage number. We are seeing a lot of the lower leveled skilled jobs, you know, um, have been either outsourced or the or, you know, whether they've gone overseas or maybe technology, automation, artificial intelligence has eliminated some of those jobs. So it has a lot to do with the mix of jobs. I can tell you employers are not raising wages right now. They are kind of steady. They're not decreasing wages, but but they are not in a situation where it's that competitive of, of a job market that they need to increase wages at this point. So it's a little misleading of an indicator when you look at it in the BLS report. All right, Joni, thank you so much for joining us. Joni Biley, she's a chief workforce analyst at Employee Bridge, joining us from uh, Omaha, Nebraska via Zoom here. So I think in this jobs report, there's something, something for everybody. For everyone. <laughs> you know, I was going to say it's like a Rorschach test. Yes, you, exactly. You, you can make a bit of what you see. We'll get one more, I guess, data point next week, CPI. So for the Fed, I mean, Ira Jersey from Bloomberg Intelligence just put out a note here and saying, you know, that, that, that'll have some meaning as well for the Fed in terms of inputs about whether they go 25 basis points so, or more. So what I think is interesting is that if we get a read from, um, uh, from where do we have the Fed speak coming? W w uh, Waller. Woo, oh, right. Couldn't get that name. If we get a little bit more of a temperance there and maybe the market starts pricing in 25, I am wondering what the front end of the curve winds up doing. Do we need to kind of sell off a little bit because we've had such a massive run into the bond market, particularly in that front end, really flattening uh, or disinverting that curve of the 210? So I'm kind of paying attention to that. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Let's go back to this jobs report because Ab Abigail suggested that's a big part of what's driving the sell-off in, in today's market. We welcome Christopher Smart. He's a managing partner in our growth group. Uh, he's a former special assistant to the president for international economics. He joins us from Boston, Massachusetts. And if you're listening to us up in Boston, our new home is now 92.9 FM in Boston. Christopher, how do you think the folks down in DC that really think about this economy, worry about this economy, try to manage this economy, how do you think the folks down at DC are taking this uh, labor data we saw today? Well, first of all, welcome to 92.9 in Boston. We're all very excited to have you. Um, Thank you for the plug. New, on a new channel. <laughs> Um, in terms of what they're doing down in Washington, I'm afraid they're probably spending a lot more time thinking about um, the election um, uh, implications of all of this. Ah. I'll just pause and not answer your question right away. I think it is quite remarkable that we are talking about a Fed cut of 25 or 50 basis points two months out of election. And most of the market and most of the nonpartisan analysis would be that this is totally unrelated to any political calculation on the part of the Fed or the Biden administration. So I think that's 
kind of a nice plug for Fed independence. Um, in terms of the jobs report, there was something for everybody, I think, in this report. For the hawks, there was, you know, the unemployment rate notched down a little bit, hourly, hourly earnings were up a little bit, and so that would give them fuel to argue for 25 basis points. Um, for the doves, you know, we still have a miss in terms of the headline uh, jobs growth number. Um, and we have downward revisions of the past couple of months. So I think, you know, as I say, there's plenty to fuel both sides of the debate. My, my bias would still be that we're going to see 50 basis points um, because of the other data that we've seen accumulating. And because, you know, as long as they are able to signal maybe as a hawkish cut um, that this is not, you know, we're not going to get three 50 basis point cuts for the next three meetings. Mm. We're going to do 50 now and then wait and see till the end of the year. You're right. So it's not like they're overdoing it. They're like, OK, we'll go now, but then let's just see. Um, what in the economic data tells you that we need 50? Because the other part of the argument is like, look, if you go 50, you're saying things are a lot worse than you might have thought. Well, to me, you know, maybe to argue with your previous um, guest uh, that you know, I, inflation is really not the problem anymore. It is a problem politically. It is a problem for consumers. It's a problem for low, lower income households. But the, the, the numbers are coming down. The, 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 if, you're, if you're in the monetary policy business, you see that you're pivoting from fighting inflation now to boosting growth. And I think they have plenty of room to move from current levels down to something a little bit a little bit easier, if not, you know, the, the, it's certainly going to be still in the in the tight range. The economy is slowing in the U.S. There's much more slowing going on in Europe. China is obviously stuck right now, um, so I don't see the risks to inflation right now. And I really think, as you see, you know, that is those are big headlines coming out of Governor Wallace's speech. If that's the broader message he intends to deliver. Um, you know, I, I think that's going to increasingly turn markets towards expecting 50 next time. Chris, you mentioned kind of the timing here. We're in an election year, and it looks like this Federal Reserve is going to be pretty active in terms of making some policy changes right around this election. How uncomfortable do you think that makes the Fed? I think it makes them very uncomfortable. I mean, um, Jay Powell has been asked about this through a couple of different meetings. He's been very forceful and I think very credible at saying, look, we don't, you can, you can read our minutes, we don't talk about this. We don't talk about the election. We don't talk about any of that. We look at the data. It's hard enough getting the data right. And it's hard enough setting monetary policy for this dual mandate, uh, let alone taking other, um, uh, other election implications into view. So I think uh, it, is, it is notable that they, are, they feel free to do it now. I think they don't love the fact that they have to do it now, but they, I think, feel that this is the right time. The data is pointing in that direction. Markets are expecting it and that they can move ahead. I, I don't think they'll get any more you know, cuts in October or anything like that, um, but they'll pick up after the election and see where the data uh, guides them. You were also a former special assistant to the president for international uh, economics back in your uh, previous life from 2013 to 2015. We've been getting a lot of information about economic plans, particularly when it comes around corporate taxes. And I'm wondering if you've been able to think about or model out um, the different outcomes on corporate tax policy. Like clearly, yes, lower corporate taxes will be good for the S&P. But in terms of, say, reinvestment and economic growth, well, the devil is always in the details. President Trump's proposal is eye-catching in terms of a dramatic cut in the headline rate, but that seems to be linked with manufacturing things in the United States. And I think he talks about you know 100% manufacturing in the United States. Very little, as you know, is 100% manufactured in the United States, given the inputs to, um, uh, to to manufactured goods that come from many many other countries. Sometimes, you know, I think they say that if you buy a car in the U.S. There are parts that have crossed the Mexican border five or six times before it reaches the, the dealer's lot. Um, I would guess what markets are expecting is that, you know, corporate rates are probably not likely to move much more in, from where they are right now. Vice President Harris is in line with the Biden proposal to raise them to 28 percent. President Trump is talking about 15 percent. You know, we have this thing called Congress, which is a big toss up. And more likely than not, you know, it may move one or two basis, one or two percentage points up or down, but it's not going to be a significant uh, shift, I don't, I don't think. So 
Chris, to what extent are you, your team, folks in Washington, D.C., are they talking about, you know, annual deficits? I mean, and annual deficits, the national debt. Is that is, is this something that any gets any serious conversation? Yeah, I mean, de- I'm sorry, debt deficit. What, yeah, what, yeah, what totally. What, um, I, I think people like us do talk about it. People in the markets do worry about it. But if you are a politician and you're mm. looking at the next election, why should I worry about this thing that's going out 10, 20, 30 years when I've got to win? Uh, in November. Yep. So, and and and, you know, you're telling me that credit markets are going to punish me for bad behavior. Well, when? Mm-hmm. I, you know, I haven't seen it yet. And um, you know, why why take on that 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 uh, thorny issue now when I don't have to? Well, this is so what gets I, confusing, I think, about the trade deficit too. Like to that point, like don't we need the trade deficit because we need foreign investors and countries to buy our debt. So if we close the trade deficit, there's less money for them to do that. And that's where I think I get a little confused on all of it. Well, you're not at all confused. I mean, you're absolutely right that we, you know, we uh, those things are intimately related and nobody likes to talk about that. I, you know, I think the focus on the trade deficit raises a lot more issues around our savings rate, our investment incentives, and that sort of thing. Rather, you know, the, the, the proposals that we tend to go to easily as policymakers and politicians, which are tariffs, um, generally don't tend to do much to redress those differences in, in, in trade deficits that people want to because we are so interlinked in so many ways with our foreign markets and with other foreign markets. A bilateral trade deficit gets a lot of attention between the U.S. and China, but really the over, it's really the overall balance of trade that we have with, with all of our trading partners that will matter. All right, Christopher, thank you so much. We appreciate that. Dr. Christopher Smart, he's managing partner at our growth group and a former special assistant to the president for international economics. I Googled what our growth is. Apparently it's a burg in Scotland. Oh, okay. So there you go. This is the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live each weekday, 10 a.m. to noon Eastern, on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, Tune In, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.